Welcome to Black Man Lab. We are talking today about black men in the cannabis industry. I'm so glad that you all are able to join us today. Uh, we have a very good panel uh, going on today that's going to give us some great information about uh, the, the industry of the cannabis industry. So my name is Marty Monaghan. Um, I will be your host tonight along with uh, my partner in crime. Today will be Brother Fred Parham. Brother Fred. Hey, hey, Marty. Great to be back, man. How are you? I'm good, brother. Glad to have you on, man. Glad to have you running running with me again this week, man. We, I we... know, bro. I might end up having a fan base, man. If I keep <laughs> hanging out, man. You know, I think people recognize my voice now. <laughs> right, right on. Right on, man. Right on. So, uh, we, brother Miley's going to get jealous at us. Um, you know, right. <laughs> we, we had a good a good uh, chemistry, but I'm thinking you and I get a little bit better, man. Don't tell them I said it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> sound, sound like a reference. Sound like a right. reference. Everybody heard it. <laughs> right, right, right. So uh, anyway, man, um, we want to get started here because we want to get deep into our discussion. But first, uh, as always, just want to give a little background on, on Black Man Lab, how it came to be. Uh, Black Man Lab started years ago. Um, Brother Molly Davis and some of the other brothers that he worked with um, at, at uh, Let Us Make Man um, came together and decided that uh, trying to get through to their their young sons rather than them always talking to them as fathers, having some other brothers to be able to do that. So that grew into what became um, Black Man Lab. We, it's grown uh, to, we've had sessions where we've had uh, over 250 folks in the room. Um, we are able to meet live, uh, which is at the YMCA, the young YMCA. Um, right now, of course, we're doing everything virtually as most people are. So it's a little different. Uh, we don't have the, the touch that we normally would have, but we're also able to reach outside of just the Atlanta area and, and be able to get the, the messages out that we're trying to get um, as it relates to giving our, our you know, young black men some information that they, they wouldn't necessarily be able to have um, at their fingertip. Um, with that, uh, we have some traditions that we start with, uh, one of which is, is we like to get centered. So uh, what I would like to do is hand it over to Brother Fred to help us get centered. And then from there, um, Brother Derek can do, do the ancestral piece as well. So Brother Fred. Yeah, thanks, Marty. So the, the deal is for the listener audience, man, is to kind of get in a space where, you know, you're open. You can kind of transition out of the ups and downs of today or the concerns that that are carried over from the weekend. And so by doing how we do it is we just take a deep breath, man. It's real simple on three, two, one. And then we exhale three, two, one. Um, let's do it again. Three, two, one. And exhale three, two, one. In case I caught you by surprise the first time. Thanks, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate you, man. Thank you. And we need that, man. We need to have some safe and sacred spaces for us as black men, especially to be our authentic selves and be be um, you know, very free and open to to learning different things. Uh, kind of let the noise of what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and then we can uh receive what the creator has for us, right? So uh, with that, um, Brother Jared. Yes, sir, Brother Marty. I'm in. All right. Uh, we, we honor our ancestors. We honor the memory of our ancestors. And we like to hold them within our hearts and minds. So I'm going to ask everybody to think about someone. Um, sometimes I call them international ancestors. But any ancestors that... We've been spread throughout the entire world. Think of a strong ancestor right now and hold him in your heart and mind for about five seconds. And then throw your fist up and say, Ashe. 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 And then I want you to think about a national ancestor. One from here, from, a, from, the, from the nation that we have been born in. Think about one of your national ancestors. And let me give you five seconds for that. And throw your fist up and say, I say, I say, 
And then I want you to think about an ancestor, hold that ancestor from your own own ancestral line, those who created and made you. An ancestor who had whose blood runs through your veins. I want you to think of one of those ancestors and hold them in your heart and mind right now. And then throw up your fist and everybody say, I say, I say, I say oh. I say you. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, Brother Jared. With that I want to um introduce our our uh, our esteemed guests today um and and let them give a little background about uh, themselves and what brings them into this space to talk about the um cannabis industry because that's what we're gonna be talking about to, today. So with that, um we have Brother Joe Wright. Brother Joe, can you come on and just give a quick introduction of yourself and then we'll come back to you a little bit later on as well. Yes, sir. My name is uh, Joseph Wright. Um, I've worked in the cannabis industry for the past five years. Uh, I've done what I would consider ancillary services on the smaller end, just helping companies, you know, get hemp licenses and go through certain processes that I've had the privilege of learning about. I went uh, through the process when I wanted to enter the cannabis industry, I went through the process of trying to gather as much information as I can. So I went to, you know, all the Calif um, Colorado, California, Oregon, Vegas, Missouri, um, just to as many of the recreational states that I could to, to, to learn as much as I can before I made any moves. Um, I was told about, I was invited to the panel by uh, Brother Joe Barker. Uh, I worked with Gary Davis and Next Level Boys Academy for the past 12 years, uh, I believe in black boys. Um, yeah, man, I have, uh, I'm, I'm currently studying my master's of social work at Clark Atlanta University. I have a mental and behavioral health agency in Union City, Georgia. That's my family's original practice. Uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to get into the cannabis industry is because I wanted to find alternative methods of treating mental health diagnoses. So, um, yes, sir. That's a little little tidbit about me. Awesome. Well, that's great stuff, man. Appreciate it, and uh, look forward to your feedback on on what you've seen to this point. Um, brother Melick Dexter. Now, brother Melick, I want to I want to touch on something before he introduces himself. He is actually one of the uh, founding fathers of Black Man Lab. Um, uh, he, he was there with four gentlemen, uh, and he was one of the four that was part of uh, having that understanding that there was a need to have a deeper conversation with our sons um, from rather than just from father to son being some other people that could come in, other brothers that could come in that you could trust the son. So Brother Melick was that. Um, with that, I want to bring him on. Brother Melick, can you please... Give us a bit about your background. We know it, but we want the the public to know more about Brother Melly. All right. Well, first of all, I'd like to say, uh, you know, thank you all for having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure and honor to be amongst the, the brothers and our sons. And um, so I'm grateful. Uh, with that said, um, I think what's what's always more interesting than, than who I am is, uh, is, is kind of how I fit into this space and what's the significance of that. Um, so I found myself in the cannabis space in a very interesting way because um, I, I'm prone as a, as a person to, to dislike an unfair fight. Mm -hmm. And I'm very keen to the role of uh, economics, and how that plays in the, the root of disadvantaging Black people. So I came to the cannabis space uh, as, as a person who, who to this date has never smoked marijuana, any of those kind of things. Wow. I, came, I came to this space um, in search of, you know, something that for my older brother. My older brother had um, a disability that occurred later in his life with a scar on his brain that, that created, uh, you know, these seizures of a level that we were told would absolutely kill him. 
And um, so that's what started my journey looking, you know, for what I had always heard of read was cannabis oil, marijuana oil, you know, some of the stronger, you know, strands. So that, that ultimately led me to a place that exists as the perfect um, dichotomy, you know, uh, separating white existence from black existence, which is Humboldt County, the Emerald Triangle. Mm. So I was able to travel in Northern to Northern California. And what I saw there was, I mean, it's, it's, it, it really should be a tourist attraction, but you'd have to know what you're looking at. You're looking at a place that abs that absolutely exists as a result of, you know, its boundaries are racialized and it's protected by privilege. And in Humboldt County, you have white people who are absolutely positively growing what has always been a schedule one drug, marijuana. And they do so with absolute, you know, freedom and have always done it. We're talking about like third generation fa uh, farmers in that particular place. You can smell the weed before you get there. So miles before you get there and everyone is in the business. So upon arriving there, I quickly saw and noticed that these, these, I was selling weed <laughs> and, and they were selling cannabis. They weren't even selling marijuana. They were selling cannabis. I was in the game and they were, they were in the business. And the reason why this is significant is because drugs, and I'll give you the, the, the shortened story, but Drugs in this country have always <clears throat> been connected to Black people in one way or another. Our relationship with the concept of drugs is, is very complicated, all right? They have never really, they as in the powers that be white, have never been afraid of the drugs that would be in our veins or the drugs we would be under the influence of. The greatest fear was that drugs were a particular commodity that could quickly reach our pockets. So they were more concerned about the drugs and the drug money in our pockets than they were about the drugs in our veins. And so they knew that everybody wasn't gonna buy rims and, and you know, get our girlfriends painted, you know, their, their fingernails painted five different colors or those kind of buy purses and, and big cars. Some people were going to figure out how to send some, some kids to school. Some people were going to buy real estate and so on and so on. And so that's the significance of why um, it, it's drawn me to another level of activism, you know, as it relates to this space. So um, I, I'll stop there as the intro. So what I currently do with REUP, REUP is a... Um, <laughs> We have a uh, my my daughter's in the background here. <laughs> it's okay. Hey man, I love that real life. <laughs> yeah, right. you know, it's it what is they what be it talking is, about. It? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, because uh, you know, we, we're fathers as well. You know, yes, sir. Full fledged. So, so what we currently do is um, we bring another level of of scholarship to the conversation. Of, of, of legalization because 30, 35, 33 aut seemingly autonomous states awarded 97% of 35,000 cannabis businesses license all to white people and had the nerve to call that process legal. And so that's gone on for the last 10 years and it's an interesting phenomenon because clearly marijuana was proven through the COVID period to be what they call an essential business. And in it being essential, it is inflation proof. It's, it's proven. And the fact that, that its legalization was built upon the backs of, of black people is, is astounding that we represent less than 4% of the ownership, less than 3% of the ownership in this space. And, Quiet as it's kept, this is on target to be a trillion dollar business industry. And that's not only just the growing and the, the smoking and the vaping, but all of the ancillary businesses associated with it. So for us to 
be on the outside is a very interesting phenomenon as it relates to it. Because again, I represent uh, what would be considered an anomaly in the space, being that I don't, I don't smoke, you know, marijuana, I don't consume it. But I'm a businessman, I understand its significance. And so I'm, I'm that voice as a bridge trying to get more of us to l- listen and learn and move inside of this space. Because just as we're attracted to real estate and technology, this is on slate, you know, to be a trillion dollar industry. So it's a must that in this transitional moment that we have in this country, that we have to be very, very wise to not center whiteness because centering whiteness in our approaches to, to economic, racialized economic injustices will cause us to derail the real thing that we can actually do in this paradigm shift. So that's the position of re-up. Re-up, I like to say, gets us in on the crop that they won't share. All right. Brother Miller, thank you for all that, man. <laughs> we gonna go deeper, I'm sure. Hey, wait till the questions, bro. Right. Go dive. <laughs> and, and before we get to the questions, Brother Fred, I wanna bring on Brother Chris Brown. Brother Chris, can you give a quick introduction of yourself, man, and tell, you, tell us about what got you here in terms of the uh, cannabis industry? Hey, how you doing? My name is uh, Chris Brown. Uh, I was introduced into the cannabis industry uh, in 2017. Uh, we're organizing um, the groups and groups that came together to do the decriminalization on cannabis uh, in Atlanta. Um, shortly after, we, you know, of course, after they passed in Atlanta, they did a couple of different cities and municipalities, and it went on to the states, passed HB 324, and other bills uh, similar to like the hemp bill. Uh, I formed a company that obtained uh, federal AA5 exemption uh, on the federal level, which allows us to uh, grow and do transportation and do other things on the federal level. So uh, I've used that platform to do more education and and do more business development across different platforms uh, with people of color try to be primarily, but you know, we in the space that we just try to bring more uh, economic relief to Georgia. All right, appreciate you, brother. I'm glad to have you on the panel. And uh, again, we're gonna delve deeper into what everybody does. So um, brother Fred, hand it over to you. Yeah, man, I just wanna thank, uh, you know, Joe and Chris and uh, brother Melick again for, you know, just putting out, man, their depth of knowledge and most of all experience. So I'm gonna just jump right in, brothers, no parachute. Uh, and just ask what everybody and their mama wanna know, man. What's the difference between, in Atlanta speaking, decriminalization and legalization of marijuana? What's the difference there, man? So just for the listeners. And then from there, take us to how we go from, as Melik alluded to, being on the prosecution side to the businessman side. So, but I think it's important to address everybody's confusion about decriminalized and legal as it relates to Atlanta. Well, I think, um, you know, peace brother Chris, I remember you and I meeting uh, on the floors of, uh, this not the senate portion but but there was at the uh legislative aspects uh, city council level i met uh brother chris down there when they were putting in in place 324 but i'll answer it from the economic standpoint because uh again my my drive is it's more of the uh economic justice as it relates to the relationship to this plant and so decriminalization textbook is that they would scale back, move the crime from being a, 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 a crime of a more egregious fr- crime to a lesser, lesser crime. Meaning that in, in Atlanta, when the way that it, it shows up is that you have the ability to receive a ticket as opposed to this being something that works against you as a, a, um, a, a, higher, a higher, more uh, uh, incriminating charge criminal charge. But from an economic standpoint, this is part of the national ruse ruse that's being used so that we would only pursue decriminalization through legalization and not pursue the economic side of it. 
So this is why I was saying that nationally, when you look at all the companies who are having their list of demands on white legal cannabis, what's happening is that they mostly are asking for things that the owners, B2B, business to business, cannot give them. See, the 97% white cannabis license owners across this country, the way that they, they are not the individuals in many cases who are not making the decisions. They're just simply having the money to give to lobbyists so that it would go their way. Right. They're not making the decision. And so they, they're able to walk away with their hands up because they understand how business relates to law and lawmaking and decision makers at that level. The licensing committees nationwide, you know, are openly, it even said, you know, and Chris can bear witness that soon after H324 came out, HB 324 came out, it was said that the bigger companies, medicinal marijuana companies, literally gave money to, you know, the, the individuals who were making the decisions. But that's legal and that's called lobbying. It's an illegal, <laughs> lo it's an illegal lobby, legal uh, concept where you can influence a decision to your benefit if you get a lobbying license. So across the country, many of the black activism groups in marijuana are centering whiteness and asking for, asking for things that the business owners cannot give them. And so consequently, that's what we're getting. We're getting a movement of expungement and decriminalization as a result, as a, as a, in exchange for what we should be going for, which is ownership. Oh man! So, so yeah, it sounds mm -hmm. like Melly. It's like a bait and switch, huh? Oh, where, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're just happy to be. And and don't get me wrong, decriminalizing is good. Changing the sentencing is is great. It's life changing. But representation is not ownership, and ownership is the only thing, only way that that anti-black racism is sustained by economics. So then, Brother Chris, tell us a little bit about, um, I heard you and Brother Mellick mention uh, House Bill 324. I'm assuming that's a Georgia thing. Uh, some of our listeners are from out of state. So give us the, you know, a couple of quick nuts and bolts of points on House Bill 324 and how that relates to what Brother Mellick was discussing with economics and access to opportunity in the cannabis industry. HB 324 is basically the gateway that allows for cultivation and handling of, of marijuana or cannabis in Georgia. Uh, so it's, it's set the ground floor basically uh, to allow, we're basically a, we're a medicinal state, uh, we're oil only state. So we only, we only allow up to 5%, which is one of the highest in the country of what we consider low TAC oil. Um, it was the bare bone minimum basically, you know what I mean, in terms of a bill when you start talking about legalization, uh, it's probably the closest that we're going to get without them looking at the flower aspect of it because they put the stigmatize uh, of looking at flower. Um, it's racially motivated, you know what I mean? You can put right. flower and smoking weed next to a black person that's been probable cause for a very long time. Right. Um, but that right. but that bill is yeah. that bill that bill basically opened up and and, and set the parameters around the licensing structure, uh, the security measures, things things of that nature that surround it. Uh, operating a business here in Georgia in the cannabis industry. So, yeah, Marty, I just wanted to throw it back to you, but I felt like mm -hmm. establishing that ground floor for the listener audience would now but, give us But, but, but Brother guide. Fred. Come on. Oh, go but, ahead. I, I wanted to mention something. I, and again, Chris, you know, is, is being his less Malcolm X self today. Uh, <laughs> because I heard oh, okay. the brother down there lighting yeah. it up. And, and Come Chris, on, <laughs> Chris. If you would let them know what the bill looked like prior to Governor Kemp coming in, it was it yeah. that thing was really going to work for Black people until Kemp came in and, oh, and did yeah. something unprecedented. Talk to so us, Chris. If you, if you had mentioned that, Chris, how <laughs> the uniqueness of I only pharmacies. Come on now, you hold yeah. it. Yeah. Come on now. It, it, Come on. The, the, the bill you on the lab, butchered. bro. You free. Look, it, it got butchered, definitely. So we went from 10 licenses to six. You know what I mean? 10 was, you know what I mean? Wasn't a whole lot, but you know what I mean? They butchered it down even more. Uh, we had uh, things like um, having to work with with minorities and black community and veterans. Uh, that was oh, inclusive. That was now that, that got from, from being mandatory as a part of the process to being a review, uh, I think in 2022, I do believe. 
which will be well after, you know what I mean, the establishment of the licensing process. Um, there was a number of things that were struck out of that was that was struck out that would have been favorable for us. Um, man, it, 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 it was it was a bill that wasn't even supposed to pass. So if you technically, you know what I mean, I think the rules, the rules of, of, of the legislature were suspended. Uh, and it's one of the last bills that actually passed in, in, in of last year, you know what I mean? So it's one of the last closing bills of the session. Um, it created, you know, we have a commission that's, that's in place that's over the licensing piece. Um, if you ask me now, you know what I mean, about where we stand with cannabis, with the Black Lives Matter movement and what we got going on to be more progressive, I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned because this is what we should have been is that the capital, instead of, you know I mean, rent, instead of running through, trying to run through City Hall, because that's where our, our, our attention is. And that's that's your, that's our form of reparation. Mm-hmm. Um, if you had a caught part of earlier this year in February, I want to say, um, Georgia was one of the states because they, they actually de- decriminalized uh, him to get off the uh, troll substance list. Georgia made national news by actually trying to put it back on the criminalized list by taking, um, it's one of the uh, new uh, bills they put in this year that was gonna actually penalize us for him. So we talk about being racist and we talk about the things that actually hold us back. They were gonna take him, something that's been taken off the whole piece nationally, and they was gonna penalize it just as cannabis. Um, we were successful in being able to get the language removed, but I'm still hearing rumors that somewhere down, down the line, and, and brother, hopefully you can tell me some truth to this, you know what I mean? Somebody said they put it back in there. But yeah. you know, I know successfully that I have on camera, on film, we were there. Uh, we walked through the process of making sure that that was removed. But in terms of this cannabis piece, man, when we talk about black lives and having uh, reparations and different things of that nature, you know, what I mean, this is this is a grand opportunity for us to get in uh, and have a seat at the table that's going to be able to have generational wealth on down the line from things that have been leveled on our back. Wow. So I try to I try to be cool stop. about it, but it's, it's it's a big it's a big deal though. Uh, and across the nation, uh, there are more progressive states that are moving forward to looking at the revenue generating capabilities. Like we did we did budget reforms t- this year. Um, we're able to, to pay teachers and do education and put money uh, back into the system by even utilizing this plant and the revenue from this plant. Uh, this is our, you know I mean? I think this month is holistic, I forget the actual name, but it's actually a, a holistic uh, pharmaceutical type of uh, month. We look at awareness months. I was just Googling that the other day, but. We have to look at the healing, even when we talk about COVID. We know about COVID, like I said, again, I do the A5 exemption, which is research and development. Uh, if Israel, uh, I believe it was, has the clinical trials that started this year. Uh, I do believe at this point, the DEA and the FDA have accepted those things in, in America. Um, so the plan is definitely progressing in terms of the use of it. Uh, where we stand in Georgia, you know what I mean? We need to be a little bit more progressive, but across the country, uh, there's a lot of opportunity um, for us to get in, and then nobody's going to give it to us. But there's a lot of opportunity as being uh, melanated people and being users of this medicine. And just just Great. one point on the whole decriminalization uh, question that you asked. Um, the issue with decriminalization is it offers the, the police a choice. Like they can decriminalize it, but they can still opt to take you to prison. Like I know somebody who got arrested in Fayetteville the other day. And they decriminalized and fed, um, and they decided to take them to prison, you know, anyway. So it's kind of like when we talk about race and, you know, how it affects us, it's kind of one of those things where they can make the decision where, you know, maybe I can give you a ticket for you having this amount of marijuana on you or, or I can take you to jail. So that, that, that creates a problem in itself, which is why legalization is our best bet. Thanks that's, for that, that's, brother that's, Joe. That's that, state, that's that state piece. Everything that resides in terms of governance and, and criminal penalty at the state level. It's the things that we need to be trying to check. Like we got we got the the cultivation piece in, but we did not check the boxes and, and, and cover the outlines and guidelines that talked about the criminal penalty of it. Um, actually, they if you really look at it, uh, HB 324 actually gave you mandatory minimums in there. And people don't even talk about that. But it gave you mandatory minimums of being caught with this oil and, and trying to distribute this oil with mandatory minimum sentencing uh, guidelines that's actually included in the bill. Got which it. is which is which is an unprecedented you know concept. Another thing, uh, brother Chris mentioned did not mention, um, and he and I talked about it in person, is that a, a, a very unique thing. There there was actually more than ten licenses, but they removed them all with uh, Governor mm-hmm. Kemp coming in, and then 
there are no dispensaries in the state of Georgia, they will, they will be dispensed. Marijuana will be dispensed through pharmacies. So across this country, now I want that to sink in for a second. Now that who can compete with Walgreen money, Walgreen, uh, Walmart money, right. CVS money and trying to obtain as, as black pharmacists fall out of the business. It'll be very difficult to obtain that particular licensing. But in addition to that, uh, another aspect of it across the country to bring it net national and also deal with what happened in Georgia, as, as marijuana legalization moved from left coast to east coast, everywhere there were larger white populations, this is where recreational took place first. But when they began to move into populations that were more densely us, what we call the chocolate cities, they went uh, medicinal instead of recreation. Because when they came in as they did with Georgia, the criteria to become a licensed operator for a medicinal particular a medicinal state, you have to have you know, grand infrastructure to deal with, with pharmaceuticals. And now, there won't be any black, you know, entrepreneurs in that space because we don't not necessarily have, you know, that experience. So this only simply means that if you've owned a license in another state, then you'll be able to own it in another state and in another state. And this is what's called in this industry, an MSO, a multiple state operator. So it, it was set up in such a way that if you did not have that type of experience, you couldn't even be considered. That's just understood. So that's why they come in talk, come from a standpoint of medicinal. And, and so that way that all of us, we only show up for the concept of trying to obtain recreational license. But the way that they've been moving that is once a state comes in as medicinal, then you're grandfathered in and you get first dibs on the recreational licenses, hey, which again puts us at a great distance. <laughs> That's the one piece. Yeah, so brothers, brothers, let me jump in that big money. Good stuff, guys. Let me jump in here, brothers, because uh, we got some questions coming in from from uh, outside that we want to make sure we have time to get in. This information that you guys are giving is awesome, um, and it's it's giving us some kind of culturalistic look at um, why we need to be um, invested. In, in this industry um, and, and we need to be conscious of how this industry has, has gotten to where it is today. With that, let me ask one question. Um, when you talk about um, the cannabis industry and getting started in it, um, what, do you, what, what is needed? I think that we wanna make sure that our young brothers that are out there that are, have some level of interest in, in being in the cannabis industry, whether that's Looking at having a dispensary, whether it's looking at being some sort of broker, whatever the case, what, what do you, um, and maybe Brother Joe, I'll, I'll pose this to you. What do you see as the, the, the path to get there? I believe the best thing you can do is do your, first of all, first and foremost, you need to do your own research. You can't listen to what people are trying to tell you about the industry. You, like you can get into spaces where you're gonna have people talking about it and you can learn from them. But you, at the end of the day, you have to take it, the initiative yourself to go out there and do the research. You gotta ingratiate yourself in the field so you can know the ins and outs. Because what you have in this industry is sharks, people that are preying on people that don't know anything, trying to get into, indus trying to get into the industry. So when that happens, what they'll do is they'll take advantage of you, they'll, they'll get your money, you'll have somebody it comes to you and says, hey, man, if you give me twenty five thousand dollars, I can guarantee I can guarantee that you'll be, you know, we'll we'll give you a spot in on this licensing call or this licensing contract. And what they don't tell you is that twenty five thousand dollars is not refundable. You know, what I mean, like the amount of money that you put in, if you're like if you get together with a group and you're going after acquiring a hemp license to get together with a group or you're going after acquiring a marijuana license to produce, distribute um, or anything like that. The money that you put up to invest is not refundable. So what, what people would do is take advantage of those who have money or those who have the ambition to want to be into the industry and, and sell you uh, dreams like they do in every other industry, but it's a little bit, I believe it's a little bit more pronounced in this field because everybody's an expert, if you ask them. 
So I think it's very important to, first of all, do your own research. Uh, uh, don't listen to what everybody tells you. You got to know things. You need to know your federal versus your state law. You need to know about the supremacy clause. You need to know how, you know, what that means is, you know, the federal law stuffs trade state law every time. And like Mr. Mallet was saying, with um with uh uh with re you know, you 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 have to put yourself in a situation basically to succeed. You need to uh support your local grassroots organizations. I was gonna bring up re and what he has going on because I believe in him and what he's doing as far as the uh the simple way I would say is maybe crowdfunding. I know that's probably not the best way to uh, to describe what you're doing, Mr. Malik, but uh, yeah, I think, you know, you know, supporting your local grassroots organizations, getting tied into organizations that are actually going to benefit you and benefit your clauses and put you in the space around other people who have the same ambitions as you. So you can kind of learn and uh, and figure out the best way for you to enter the industry. Also, you got to think about other forms of internet industry. You got to think about ancillary services, like in some in some states, uh, like in a state like Georgia, where it's still pretty much federal. You know, it's still pretty much illegal for us to operate in the space. You got to figure out how you can provide services, and, you know, and get close and get a know-how in the industry without you know breaking the law. So you can do, you know, ancillary services. Which an example of that would be you know manufacturing technology startups are huge. The technology in the marijuana industry is changing every day. And if you can get ahead or get a hold of something like that, that's, a, I think, one of the best ways to, to, to try to get into the industry. Uh, Cannabis-focused attorneys, you know, banking solutions. Uh, what I say, what I was taught is, you know, trying to transfer. If you have a skill that you already have outside, it's an open market right now. People are still figuring things out. So you can figure out how you fit into the industry, bringing your skill. Like with the like with the attorneys, they come into the um, the cannabis industry and start defending certain people. So, simply, I would say, like I was saying in the beginning, support your local grassroots organizations. You got organizations like Minorities for Medical Marijuana, uh, Reup. Um, you know, Chris, like as Chris Brown, I know him as well. He's both of them are real active in the industry, especially in Georgia, especially on the uh, you know the active the act the activism side and just you know bringing awareness. So. Just getting tied into to things like that would be like my first um, advice. Party, I think is on mute at the moment, but now great, great advice, Joe. Uh, I hope the listeners who are depositing questions in here can uh, can hear and and check in with those two organizations, Ria and Minorities for. Mar what was it, marijuana? Minorities for medical marijuana. Minorities for medical marijuana. Okay. Chris, Go ahead, Marty. You back? Yeah, Go yeah. Ahead, I'm brother. sorry. Go ahead, Joe. I, I, I was no, saying. No. Yeah, I was saying. Does brother Melick? Did you have any more feedback on that? Yeah. Um, well, um, I think I, I I tend to be one that I don't like to oversimplify a thing. We we are we are at war. Those are the 97% of all the licenses from seemingly, you know, autonomous states, 33 to be exact, at, at that point, you're only 17 states away from it being a wrap, all right? So if they didn't stop at, 20, at the 25 mark and say, oh, gosh darn, or whatever white boys say, that we have not let black people in, it's safe to say that's the, that's the coursework that they're on. 97% licensure going to an all white cast is not an accusation, it's a data point. So this is one of the, this is a racial injustice. So I don't wanna oversimplify it that it's a matter of, of and I respect that, that is just, you know, it, it, it's a lot involved. What needs to happen is become aware of, of, of of, of the state of existence that we're in and what why they keep diverting it to just expungement. But the other thing is that like, like the young brother said, become informed, but we have to work together. And when you do so contact, you know, I'm very open to, to you know, discourse about this, but I do wanna, you know, quickly explain that, see the investment aspect is, is very interesting. Because as a result of Marcus Garvey, many people don't know this, that Marcus Garvey 
crowdfunded. That's where crowdfunding first started, but more so crowdfunding, which sounds like a low level of putting monies together. He literally did a, what's called a capital raise. Now he was, that's the SEC came into existence. The Security Exchange Commission came into existence to make sure that the poor people could not put their monies together and raise money and compete with larger companies. That's what it came into existence for that very purpose so that black people would stay at the socially designated as, 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 as the bottom tier of, of this society. So according to um, Obama, President Obama passed, I think it was in 2012, the Jobs Act, Jumpstart Our Businesses, which allowed for private companies to literally raise from people who are not accredited. Accredited investors are individuals who have a net worth of a million dollars, and non-accredited are people who are less worth less than that. Prior to 2012, we could not invest in the, the Ubers, the YouTubes, the Airbnbs, and so on and so on. So now that we can, we have to connect. And, uh, and Let's Re-Up is one of those enterprises that will allow us to put our monies together and to do that inside of this space. So that's, that's how I would answer the question. Um, you know, uh, as it relates to how to invest and how to get in. And I think someone even asked how to become a farmer. But there are lots of, uh, I mean, believe it or not, YouTube is a, is a great example. There's also books on Amazon and other sources that you could, you know, study to actually grow and learn to, to grow the plant. Awesome. Speaking of that, that's a great transition. Um, one of the questions that I've had uh, come across to me, even prior to us doing this tonight, was, how do you, is there a way to become a farmer? Um, not so much of being a dispensary or anything like that, but just being able to grow um, cannabis legally and then being able to distribute to, to whoever. Is there a way to do that? And, and how, do, how does that occur? I mean, it's designed to, see, the fact that this thing is operating state by state, that's not, it's chaotic on purpose. It's chaotic on purpose. And so each state has its own level of uh, own laws that govern each thing, which is why we alluded to earlier with Brother Chris was saying HB 324 is a um, is, is the way that it occurs is different. So that's why it's important for us to understand that that nothing else, you know, shows up this way. So, um, so to answer your question more specific, bro, is that you can, you would have to be in a legal state to grow, you know, legal um, actual marijuana that has THC. But of course, you could grow hemp, but there will be no distributing it or those kind of things because, you know, these things are governed. The ability for Black people to move themselves, and this is why I keep taking it to this, the, the economic justice aspect, anything that allows us to empower ourselves economically and remove ourselves from America's bottom, it has legal ramifications to it. Because that yeah. is how anti-Black racism is sustained. Right. Absolutely. The devil is always in the detail, Brother Melik, as you well know. And, and so uh, I wanted to pull uh, Brother Joe back in. There's a question from Facebook that I wanted to get to. It says, does owning a cannabis license automatically forfeit your ability to own a firearm? Do either of you know that? Or is that something that even is considered at the state level? I do not, I do not have the answer to that question. Does um, owning a cannabis license automatically forfeit your ability to own a firearm? I don't see why it would. Right. The two things don't seem to be connected, I don't think, one uh, for one. And from what the brothers are saying, who've been direct relationship to the bill that empowers a person to get a license, I don't think the two of them are connected. However, um, and, I and wanna... just real quick uh, to go back to that question about the uh, the the farm, the issue with that, and what what Mr. Malek was alluding to is, in order to say, in order to have, if you want to do that in Georgia right now, if you want to grow hemp. And you wanted to, if you wanted to grow him and you wanted to sell it at the same time, you would have to apply for two licenses. You would have to apply for a license to produce and you would have to apply for a license to distribute. And that is not set up for, like he was saying, that's set up for the Walgreens, the CVSs, the, the, the big farmers, those type of companies. That's not set up for 
for small business owners or people like us trying to enter the industry, uh, you know, from a business standpoint, because you have to spend so much money in order to do so. It's a $25,000 fee in order to secure a, uh, what is it, a, a $25,000 non non-refundable application fee in order to get a, a license to cultivate marijuana legally in Georgia. And that's, and and that's $500,000 to actually, you know, uh, after you, you know, fill out the application. Exactly. This, that's just the application fee is $25,000. No, non-refundable. Non-refundable. Exactly. Yeah, so, 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 so let me, let me just, so our audience can hear this, just to be clear. $25,000 to say, hey, I would like to try to get a, a license. And then once they say, okay, you can get a license, Brother Melick, you're saying it's another $500,000? A little bit different than the order. Twenty-five. You, you will not even get to write your name on the application if you cannot show proof of funds for a, meta, a, a cannabis company that is already in the bank and your $25,000. Oh, wow. So in other words, you don't even go that far that you're already dissuaded at the, excuse me, can I have an application process? You have a $200,000 licensing fee and a $100,000 annual renewal fee. So, wow. so. And that's the, it, now is that, just to be clear, is that the same for if I wanted to have a, a brick and mortar location to dispense as well as to have, like if I just wanted to grow? I don't want this, all I want to do is just, I want Culture. to grow. And for cult this for cultivation. If you want to cultivate cannabis in Georgia, those are the parameters, you know. And you have to also it's a whole guideline structure. But like you said, before you even get started, it's twenty five thousand to put out. Now you got to have your half a million dollars uh, already in the bank. You got to show proof of funds. You know, what I mean, you have to show that you are working with minorities. You don't. It's not. It wasn't. It wasn't a mandatory piece, but they they suggested that you'll be inclusive in the consideration phase. That you're working with minorities or veterans, et cetera, et cetera, uh, prior knowledge or prior history in in, in the industry um, was preferred. Um, so there's always a consideration uh, panel that they give you, uh, and you're one of many people that's going to apply. And so you have big pharma companies that's applying. You have um, private companies that that are backed by other larger companies that's applying. So it's, it's very competitive, especially when you're applying for only one, one of six licenses. Well, in the way that breaks down also, the six licenses are divided up that, that four of them go to large companies and only two are left for private businesses. Wow. And in addition to that, explain to me how in a state where it is illegal to have a cannabis license or to grow cannabis, you already have a cannabis company with $500,000 in the bank and you ain't in jail. Oh, See, it's so it's, it's counterproductive. It's just it's set up for you if you you can't play in that space. It's not designed for that. That's how why they go in first medicinal, and then they grandfather in those who have those licenses into recreational. And all of the states who start medicinal mostly go in swearing that it'll never become recreational. I know. And then of course it does. And then of course it does. And then they whoever already has license. Florida, brother Chris, am I correct? That they're the perfect example who of a company that, of a place that went in based upon oil, not flour, saying that they'll never go recreational and it'll never <laughs> be strong. But then they moved from the the, the light T H light C B D small T B T H C oil to a stronger T H C oil, then to flour, and now they're opening up their licenses only to those who already had licenses in preparation to go full full blown recreation. Wow. Yeah, you, that's that's about right. That's 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 to the point where we shall already be a full medical state, you know what I mean? And so to solve the problem since we was already faced with uh them trying to criminalize uh hemp, which is which is known for CBD, uh for its medicinal and industrial uses and benefits. Uh you know what I mean? It was my recommendation that I was telling a lot of organizers that we should have been pushing is that we just add flour and add uh, pharmaceutical grade CBD to our registry. And, you know I mean, that would have been a great addition this year uh, to add. So, you know what I mean, they're, they're, if we're gonna move strategic in this whole piece, Georgia, you know what I mean, you gotta remember was the last state to end slavery. You know what I mean, we know, we know the, white, the white mindset, you know what I mean? But we are moving so far forward with this momentum that we have to be solutionary in our thinking. 
and, and how do we progress in a faster manner uh, to quote unquote justify and use the civic platforms to to want educate our people because they use they use the numbers against us. It's not enough people that even knew about uh, the program. It's not enough people that was even signed up to have, you know what I mean? We have uh, no TAC registration cards uh, that's issued between this issued by the Department of Health. Uh, we've had that program since 2015. There are still so many people who don't even know anything about it. So when you start trying to justify numbers, you know what I mean? We can plead and argue about the, about the, the statistics, but we have to do a better job of educating our people. Uh, and that's just black and brown and, and just people in, in general, because you're serving a population of, of what we're saying of patients. What they, what they concern, part of their concern that they raised was about the cartel and the different organized crime, uh, mob families and everything else that's gonna come into Georgia. And basically we'll be a whole, you know what I mean? Shoot them up, bang, bang state, you know what I mean? Running all this drug cartel stuff through Georgia. Uh, while in the same time, they knew that if, if, if we keep it small and, and, and very personalized that those people got in, which some people, you know what I mean, they say was already in, uh, would definitely be able to cash in strong. You know, they'd be able to cash in three, four times as much, um, if not more than what they what they pay to get in. And mm-hmm. it's a five it's a five year piece. So you can only cat they put it where you can you can only cash in in year five and sell your license. Mm-hmm. So that's we can look and anticipate that year five would be the blowout, would be the blowout, you know what I mean, time. Um, for recreation or any other thing that might be coming to Georgia. So let me ask this question, man, because, you know, I, I know that the conversation is just eye-opening for me, so I can only imagine the listeners. I want to ask the listeners and viewers to go ahead and keep the questions coming uh, while, you know, we reach our 20-minute our mark. But I wanted to ask, man, more specifically to you know, the, the, the critics of this, this activist posture, and I love Melik, is sitting it right here in economic justice. What do you say to those who, you know, criticize uh, the movement for, you know, marijuana becoming a, a, a business that people can be proud to be associated with? Because I know in many circles, people have, you know, their lingering kind of own ideas and, uh, you know, so prejudice is about it. So, bro, Melik, I know you've been at it a while, and I'm sure you've talked to some folk who, who uh, you know, who just don't get it. So what would you say to that, that crowd? I think that our people are traumatized, you know, around this subject, you know, uh, simply because the war on drugs was, was racial injury. Uh, Huff, Huffing, Huffing, Huff Post, Huffington Post had an article recently about the trauma of racial injury. And I think, uh, I don't recall the date right off, but I would you know, just Google that because they went into one of the main effects that made this a different type of uh, injury was the fact that it was intergenerational. And so as it relates to our people understanding, we, we don't understand the fact that this is actually an opportunity to own our own health modality. That's the power of this. As I mentioned, I came into this space not as a smoker. I came into this space because of something for my brother. And I need to say, my brother literally has not had one seizure from the day that I found that all to date. And mm-hmm. so this is an opportunity for Black people who are, quote unquote, the sickest people in America, disproportionately sick. We would actually own our own health modality if we got into this space. And so... I don't need to say about, you know, what's happening in this country right now, in Absolutely. this world right now, as they prepare a, a COVID-19 uh, vaccine, the type of money that people, we can't even count the zeros that's going to come when that actually hits the market. So imagine us being able to deal with, you know, all of the hypertensions, the diabetes and so on and so on that, that uh, marijuana has been proven to, to exactly. you know, heal. That, that's amazing. And, and um, the fact that it's out there and the fact that when I say it's out there, meaning that it's it literally could be a cure or, or um, a means of, of making many different medical conditions aside, that it's out there. And we, we, we run into this government piece of um, how it gets to market or doesn't get to market for one reason or another, because we know the pharma industry is about one thing and one thing only um 
and, and everybody on here knows what that's about, so I don't need to get into it. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the other aspects of the, the business in terms of the ancillary um, opportunities that are out there for folks it may help them to be able to bridge the gap to get into the, the cannabis industry. Sure. Things, things like um, you know, people, I know a lot of people, there's a lot of edible chefs out there now. Um, there's also, um, and you guys can talk more, more intelligently about this, but people that are brokers, and I don't know what all that means, but I've, I've heard that I know somebody who says he's a broker for a dispensary. Um, also, what are stock opportunities? You guys know about any of that stuff? So I'll throw that out there and let you guys you know, kind of run through it. Uh, well, I'd per- say, personally, I, uh, I tell go ahead, Chris. I, I tell people best is that, you know what I mean, uh, they're saying, I think the number's around like 15%, more than any job that you will get in the regular sector, you know what I mean, whether it's accounting or whatever you, that you're doing, there's pretty much a, a complimentary job in the cannabis industry that will probably pay you up to 15% more what you're making, hmm. you know, in the regular sector. So uh, there are all type of jobs that don't require that you actually touch the plant or come in with any involvement with the plant. Uh, there are things like edibles and other type of packaging and um, transportation and all different types of sectors in, of industry. Uh, cannabis is definitely an industry of itself uh, that, that embodies all of these different careers uh, and opportunities. And as the market expands in different areas and it becomes more localized in your, your particular jurisdiction, uh, there'll be more and more opportunities. You know what I mean? So people just should be doing more exploration around what does that look like? And I'll tell some of the kids, you know, uh, as we do agriculture and you start talking about, I think one of the questions was, uh, I want to start growing. Well, I don't know if you want to grow or just manage a grow operation, but I guess the first part of growing is not learning, learning agriculture, uh, learning how to really grow. Um, it's the same concept. You know what I mean, and so just taking these different jobs and, and, and doing business development and creating these opportunities uh, in a sector that we know that it's making a lot of money. You know, it's going to be here for a while. Uh, you better take those skills that you've learned in, in your four-year institution or two-year institution or, or just the, your hustle that you got, you know what I mean? And use the same uh, talents uh, in this sector. You know, I know some people that are just doing packaging and they're making this being, being creative, um, even in the black market uh, in, in, in that sector because they're doing it in, in a legalized state, but it's nothing against the packaging uh, itself. So they're still making good money. Uh, um, being able to just even to provide that and then be like, I'm a print broker. Uh, I don't have to necessarily print it myself. All I have to do is locate a company that actually does it, uh, get the templates and stuff for it and, you know what I mean, and do the setups for it. And now I'm a, a cannabis print, you know what I mean? Printing company that can print. I, I want to say something to the stocks too about that with what, what Chris is saying. Uh, because I think a lot of us as black people are running to do the stocks. Well, just keep in mind that the stock market operates, they inflate stock value and then the goal of every company that enters into the stock market and going public is to exit and so what chris is saying is really powerful because these are real trades that you stay in, con- in control of and in ownership of and you know that what they say is that when everybody's I, well, i'm gonna quote it wrong because i don't know the way they say it but when there's a gold rush you should invest in you know in picks you see, go into the, the shovel business. I think that's something kind of the way they said it. So instead of everybody running into, you know, uh, to grow the flower or to, you know, pre-rolls or something like what Brother Chris is saying, it's very important. I personally would advise us to, to steer away from the stock end and to go into the trades like what Chris is saying, the accounting, building the software, there, there's lights, you know, there's different incubation, you know, strategies, those kind of things. So uh, I'm in support of what he's saying. I, I would think so. At, at a 15 percent uh, increase across the board, <laughs> I would say, you got me thinking I've been a BP of sales for a good while. Maybe I've been doing <laughs> the wrong thing, on thing, man. Oh, yeah. Cannabis <laughs> lawyers. You have cannabis yeah. contract lawyers, right, Chris, that just yeah. simply negotiate that for you. There's licensing deals state for uh, state. There's all type of the CPG, you know, that's that's just where it is. You need somebody somebody has to tell you you're basically paying for a service. You know what I mean? Even, you know, even for myself, and I think that most of us uh who freelance who were advocate advocates or activists in the moment or for the cause or the reason, got into this, learned a lot, going into that gold dome and walking out. You walked out of that gold dome, seeing something, learning something, 
on with something that somebody else didn't know. That became yeah. a service. You know what I mean? Right. This is simply because it's, it's, it's so much. you were there. So, yeah, and, and, and it comes so much that if you learn it, you stay, you stay hooked to it, you start learning the ins and outs. You start to become a specialist, you know what I mean? A person pays for knowledge, it's a service. You offer your service to basically maneuver people, you know what I mean? Some people are using it for other purposes, whether they're gouging people or, or finessing people. Um, but there's some good people out here that, that are organizing, that are actually, you know what I mean, uh, starting and forming companies that are basically on the ground, even some of the big companies. They can't afford to be here like that, but they'll pay you as a small company, you know what I mean, uh, with your business set up to help be on the ground, uh, to move around for them. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of opportunity. It's an industry uh, within mm -hmm. itself. So, you know I mean? That's why the numbers are getting so astronomical uh, and keep continuously going up. Um, is that once we start to see some form of legalization, and I heard it's going to be hard because it's, a, it's some major concerns that they're concerned about. Uh, in terms of about control, everything is about regulated market. You know what I mean? Nobody can monopolize. Not as something to get stuff as part of regulated industries. But, you know what I mean? Their, their strategy, you know what I mean? Even with the big companies, even on how they invest and swallow up little companies. Uh, you know what I mean? Sometimes some people are designed to, to start a smaller company just to get swallowed up. Uh, there's just so much opportunity. I tell people all the time, learn the business, understand the business, know the history behind it, know, know the, the civic side of it as well, because everything is, is, is governed by the laws and policies that are in place. Like your ignorance can cost you everything. And so while we think that we're going to do it, like I say, Georgia, Georgia has, again, mandatory minimum. So for those who are on the black market who think that I could just go in and once the, once the industry get here, you know, get, get this weed I've been selling for a long time, I could bust it down, uh, you know what I mean, extract it down, and I can start selling me some oil because all these patients need it. But understand that this is medicine for people. You know what I mean? People are really using this stuff for medicine and for healing. You know what I mean? I think that's one of the biggest highlights of 2017 for me is being introduced to the, to the community and actually seeing real healing going on. I mean, this is black folks, white folks. This is, you know what I mean? We've seen it all. You know what I mean? We've seen, you know what I mean, the, the white parents who may be a little bit more well off that really is putting in the top dollar to go fly out to bring this stuff back here. You know, we know how it go in the black market. You know what I mean? It, it's cheap in the hood. You know what I mean? It's a little bit more expensive on the outskirts. So they used to say, they, they used the same concept um, and people just want to obtain good quality medicine, man. You know what I mean? I'm a patient myself. I don't use opioids. I haven't used opioids in a very long time. And, you know, there was opportunity. I knew about it, but I didn't know what I knew now in 17. I know so much more. And, I, you know what I mean? I'm looking at my grandma, my, my immediate family of people who have utilized the same oils and the same uh, regimens to, to get pain relief. I'm so happy that they did the hemp situation because hemp was the gateway to cannabis. You know what I mean? So if, you, if, if, if you're so happy with, with CBD, which is not gonna solve all, your, all your elements, you know what I mean? Come on over to the cannabis world and start learning about the different compounds and learning about the receptors and, and the health benefits. Like that's a, that's a big sector and there's a big void uh, in that lane. You know what I mean? Just people being able to educate people. Like just imagine who's in charge of making sure that people get educated. Or putting on forms like what we're doing right now. This this is this is education to a lot of people that need to know. This is this is our economic relief. This is our opportunity to grow. Um, and I really appreciate y'all brothers for putting this on, you know what I mean, giving me the call because this is gonna open some eyes, you know what I mean? It, it started with the incubation of stuff just like this right here. And and that's that's the purpose, uh, brother Chris, of Black Man Lab. We're, uh, what we are trying to do here is provide our young brothers and our community in general, especially now that we're doing it virtually, what we're trying to do is provide information that, that our folks don't normally have access to. And as we talked about earlier, um, Brother Melick, I think you touched on it a little bit, um, what goes on in other communities, and I'll be specific about it, in white communities is that this information is just handed down generation to generation. And um, they don't have the, the challenges, I guess you could say, that we have in, in terms of this information about everything being readily available. So we have great appreciation for the knowledge that you three brothers have brought um, today. Um, what we want to kind of wrap up here with is what we do every week is we talk about habits, rituals, and disciplines, things that we do every day that make us um, be able to move forward in this world that we live in, especially as black men, um, they keep us focused. Um, but also help us to move forward and, and be in a space where 
we're, we're receptive of whatever the creator has for us. So I'm just going to go to each of you guys and just kind of give me a quick of what your habits, rituals, and disciplines are that you do on a daily basis that uh, keep you going. Um, and, and then we're going to get into some other of our, of our traditional wrap up stuff that we do. Brother Wright, I'll start with you. Can you tell us about your your habits, rituals, and disciplines that you do on a daily basis? Yes, sir. Um, I am a big believer in fitness, physical fitness, personal fitness. I wake up every day at 5 a.m. except for Sundays and I work out outside of my house. I built myself a, uh, a rack outside my home to where I can work out. I, fitness is one of the best things for me. I think once you start really taking care of your body, it, it leads to you kind of taking care of your mind in, in both orders. Once you start taking care of your body and investing in yourself, that energy kind of exudes from yourself. So once you start doing that, you know, the people around you kind of be like, kind of start looking at you a little differently in, in the same light. Like, wait a minute. It seems like he cares about, you know, it seems like he cares about himself. So I, I, I think it's very important to invest. I believe in self-care. So, you know, back to my, my rituals. Like I said, I wake up every morning, 5 a.m., work out about an hour and a half. I go and sit in the sauna. And then, you know, while I'm sitting in the sauna, I try to meditate, kind of center my thoughts, and center my mind, plan my day, my day, you know, go through my mental checklist of what I need to have done. I try to write down my goals. I try to talk about what I try to put out into the air, my goals. I try to put out into the universe my goals and just talk about it and speak it into reality, trying to manifest my reality. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. That's, yes, that's great stuff. And, and self-care is, um, it typically is one of the things that we see on a weekly basis that people talk about in terms of their, their habits, um, and rituals and discipline. So appreciate that, uh, brother, right. Um, brother Malik. Yes, sir. Well, um, what I what I do, uh, I'm I'm very sensitive to to health and uh you know like I like my brother brother Wright, you know I'm a I'm I I'm a vegan, and I'm not vegan be just because I like animals or want to hug trees. It, it's a survival <laughs> mechanism because um, I think that we as a people, as we uncover, you know these things that have been done to us and against us. We have to also consider what we put at the end of our forks and what's on our spoons, and uh, you know, as a as a as a social justice issue, all also. So I think that you know the way that we eat, we need to re-examine its sources and its benefits to us as melanated people. Um, so I box. I'm a I'm a sit up and push up person, and um, in addition to that. Um, I make sure that I one of my habits is to listen and observe, and I make I make const, I'm a constant note taker. I I make sure that uh, my father taught me, you know, that this is for everyone. He says if you have a woman in your house, never let her feet touch the floor before yours. So that's something that I always tell my sons, just as a habit. Yeah, I think he paused there. Martin. He froze up there, yeah. Yeah, yeah Brother Chris, um, habits, rituals? Disciplines? I think uh, one of my biggest habits is always giving thanks, you know what I mean, uh, for giving, getting up in the morning time. So it's always it's going to give thanks. And um, just always trying to make sure I get home the same way I live, you know, and encouraging other people. Uh, make sure I reach out to somebody, whether it's, a, whether it's somebody of, of youthness or somebody. I come across a lot of people. So I'm always trying to help and empower and motivate somebody, you know what I mean, to do something different. Uh, so that's just kind of one of my things. And I guess, you know, I mean, with all the work that I do, um, I got to make sure I take my oil. You know, we, we're talking about cannabis. You know, I don't, I met that know for a fact that I probably wouldn't be here if I did, you know what I mean? I think the, the emotional stresses of just doing this work, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a lot. And, and I mean, it's, it's my testimony to, to know that, you know what I mean? I, I'm a patient and I think that, well, I know that the things that I've done in this space and using this, this, this plant has been life-changing. Uh, it's been some times and I think that as we, as we go out further, um, and people start to indulge, you know what I mean? I'm starting to see people to take CBD and take the tinctures and take different things. I'm seeing the growth. I'm, I'm so happy my grandmama started taking it. You know what I mean? My aunt just started taking it. She has, um, 
uh, neuropathy, you know, and she was, I watched the complaint, I watched people have and conditions. So my ritual was always to promote uh, holistic health. You know, I'm not a vegan. I do believe in trying to eat right. And so I do believe in trying to build a community to have those accessible things around us. So that's kind of my ritual is going out, seeing how I can make a difference in my immediate circle so that can become part of my lifestyle. That's great stuff, brother. That's great stuff. I, it, let me ask you just before we move on, as it relates to the, the tinctures and things of that nature, the oils, you have, do you know them specific for each types of uh, type of um, symptom that people have? Do you, you know that well? Well, so for the most part, um, I know a little bit of it. Um, for the mm -hmm. most part, it's pretty much the same type of relief for the same type of medicine. So I take my, from the tinctures to the oils, whether it's a one-to-one, -one, whether it's an RSO. Um, at my level, I'm on RSO all the time. So, you know what I mean? The one-to-ones are cool. And that's for other people, but I do know, I do know. And it's just what's, a, what's RSO? Uh, they call it Rick Simpson oil. So basically it's okay. full, full extract uh, okay. from, the, from the cannabis plant. So just pure oil. Okay. Uh, they, give, they give a lot of the can, uh, a lot of the cancer patients and people with these different uh, el, el, elements, or ailments, uh, Rick Simpson oil, you know. Chris, where can our listeners get this information online? Can you give them... Uh, or where can they reach you if they have more questions? So I'm, I have uh, uh, Care for Georgia, which is Care for Georgia on Instagram. Uh, we just changed the handle, going to update the website. It's called mycannabisfight.com, uh, which gives a lot of overview of all the legal stuff. Uh, it needs to be updated now uh, to reflect some of the new changes, but that's a great start. Uh, you can always catch me uh, on, on Instagram or, or the website. Um, Rick, Simpson or, Rick Simpson or Google that. You know what I mean? RSO, Rick Simpson or... Uh, it's a lot of information out here on this cannabis stuff, man. Um, those are just great places to start, you know. Um, Thanks, bro. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, I might have been asking for a friend. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, but it, anyway, man, look, brothers, I can't thank you guys enough for your participation today, for the information, man. This this has been great information for us, um, and I hope that our, our listening audience has has um, – you know, taking this to heart and and um, is really kind of, kind of having a better understanding from a community standpoint and from from uh, an economical standpoint what this could mean um, in terms of us doing it the right way. So thank you guys for the information. Um, one of our traditions that we have every week is that we end with um, a, a tradition of, of of linking arms when we're together. Um, in, in the same space. Today, we can't do that, obviously, because we're virtual. Um, but I see that my brother, uh, one of the founders of Black Man Lab, um, Brother Molly Davis, has joined us. So normally, either Fred or I would, would go ahead and end this out. But since Molly's here, I'm going to ask him to, to end it. And before, before I have Molly do that, I want everybody that's listening, um, there's, there's a good transition because we talked a little bit about stocks today. Um, as it relates to, to um, the cannabis industry. But next week, we're going to be talking about um, stocks and, and trading. Um, that's going to be our subject matter. So please tune in for that because we'll have some experts on in, in that field to, to talk about stocks and trading. So um, make sure you're listening in next week. Again, also, anybody that's interested in donating to the Black Man Lab, go to blackmanlab.org, and there's a donation button there. Please feel free to donate. Um, we we do all of this stuff out of um, our, our interest in community, but sometimes some of that stuff costs money, and uh, we we have to um, be able to fund what we're doing here. We we are really appreciative of the opportunity to reach out to our community and give whatever we can to help um, to to help us grow, especially in today's day and age. I think today is now is our time to do it. So um, it's a matter of us being very intentional about it. With that. Um, Brother Miley, I want to bring you in and if you can help close us out. Yeah, thank you, brothers. Thank you, Brother Marty, Brother Fred, and to our, our, our beautiful brothers, I uh, always salute uh, Brother Joe Wright as well as uh, Chris Brown and then one of our founding fathers, Brother Mellick. Uh, thank y'all for um, bestowing your knowledge and information on all of us. You know, we used to say this is for the young ones, but this is really for all of us. And we just give thanks to you brothers for um, 
you know, for studying the area and then being willing to, um, to share your knowledge and information. So I just want us to also um, make sure that we do, do the census as well as register to vote. Those are two things that um, we just want to encourage you to do. And then just tap in the Black Man Lab uh, next week. Excited about next week, obviously. Great, another great subject. So thank you, brothers. So we ask that you, brothers, uh, what we do, uh, wherever you are uh, in the Black Man Lab world, and you may be a sister, um, you may be a brother, it doesn't matter, but we want you to link arms. And when we link, when we link arms, we connect. And when we connect, we call upon our ancestor queen, Njiri Algani, uh, from Encobra, who taught us this ritual. And when we're in the room together, we say, I am a link in this chain. I am a link in this chain. In this chain. And it won't break here. And, and it won't, it break, won't break, break here. I am a link in this chain. I am a link, I'm in, a this link chain. in this chain. This chain. And it won't break here. And it, and won't, it won't break, break here. here. We are links in this chain. We, we are links in this chain. this chain. And we won't break here. And we, and won't, we break won't break here. I say. I say. Everybody, thank you again for listening. Brothers, again, thank you for being here and part of the panel. And we look forward to having um, another live discussion next week. Um, Molly, you, you traveling tonight? Yeah, we, we had Statesboro. Please, y'all, tune in on Mark Wilson. His name is Mark Wilson. Google his name. A young brother who's facing murder down in Statesboro, Georgia. We have the honor of working with Attorney Francis Johnson in out of Statesboro, Martha Hall out of Statesboro, along with Attorney Gary Spencer and Nefertara Clark. And so this is the legal team that we put together to try to defend this brother's life and try to ensure that uh, justice in Georgia applies to black folk as well as everyone else. And so that's the fight we're on tomorrow. There'll be a preliminary hearing that I think will probably be aired um, and, a, and a bond hearing. So that's the work we're doing, um, a part of this, this legal team. So the struggle continues, brothers, and, and we will win without a doubt. Absolutely. Absolutely. Travel safe, Be bro. safe on that road, bro. Peace. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you, things. man. Our great Thank panelists. You. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Great panelists. Thank friends, you. Thank uh, you. Marty. Oh, Love, oh, brother. All right, y'all. Peace. Peace. Good, Melick. All right, sir, brother Fred.